the dean of uh, engineering of this university and a founding member of uh, our center here. Uh, he is a world expert on computational ENM and uh, invented many important algorithms to solve this hugely complicated uh, electromagnetic scattering in circuit, uh, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> F, and, and he was elected to a member of uh, US Academy of Engineering and, uh, and many other awards. Uh, so uh, uh, I have a student who will join his group to, to work with him to learn some of this uh, mathematics that he will present to us very soon. So let's thank uh, Wen Chou. Yes, uh, when I was the uh, Dean of Engineering at Hong Kong, you were very much like uh, engineering to work with science. And this AOE project actually comes in a very timely fashion so that we actually get to work together. And I've enjoyed greatly working with uh, my colleagues in physics and chemistry in the science uh, faculty at this university. And the second thing I want to mention is that there are much too many projects going on in engineering that's related to AOE. So I'm only going to report a subset of that. I hope it's OK and that uh, I hope those who are left out does not feel too bad. So I'm just going to report on this topic. And since there were many talks about history in the last few uh, talks, I thought I would also cover some histories of electromagnetic theory and optics. And as you can see, uh, electromagnetic theory actually the technology started quite early in 1823 with MTS law, Faraday's law, and people were making machinery and making calligraphies even before Maxwell's equation were completed in 1864. That was actually an amazing thing. And then uh, on the other hand, <coughs> we did not know that optics was actually the same as electromagnetic theory. So the optical technology and knowledge went along a different path. And they actually used a lot of scalar wave theory to understand optics, because they understood optics as wave. And only by 1864, they realized that they are actually the same thing. Um, then we have uh, Paul Dirac, who introduced our quantum electrodynamics later with Feynman, uh, that actually quantized this electromagnetic field. And I think the uh, next important uh, landmark uh, things that happen in this area is the fact that we can make things that are very, very small now in the area of nanofabrication. And another landmark uh, achievement that has been made recently is the ability to measure single photon. And because of that, and that gives rise to what is known as quantum optics and nano optics by the 1980s. What is amazing about nano optics is that we can make structures that are on the order of 10, 20 nanometers and the wavelength of light Okay, blue light is only about 400 nanometers. So many of the structures that we make now are actually sub wavelength Before that, you only worry, worry about scalar wave theory. Now you actually have to solve full Maxwell's equations in order to, to understand the vector nature of the electromagnetic field in the area of nano optics. Another thing that happens around 1980 was the fact that uh, somebody did an experiment, I think Eggert and so on, to actually Prove that quantum mechanics is actually spooky. And they actually were on the side of the Copenhagen School in the interpretation of quantum mechanics rather than on Einstein's side. Because quantum mechanics was spooky, you can have the field of quantum information. And by 1980s, there were lots of interest in quantum uh, information, quantum computing, quantum cryptography, and so on. And, but a lot of these experiments are easily or more easily done with microwave or maybe even terabit signal. And there's a growing area of uh, called quantum electromagnetics, even though h bar omega is much smaller there compared to the optical frequencies. Many quantum nature of electromagnetic fields are actually discovered at uh, higher frequencies, as you notice. And if we just look at the technologies that we have uh, in electromagnetics and optics, Electromagnetics have driven antennas, which is extremely uh, important for wireless communication. The cell phone you have has an antenna in it. Of course, radar became very important during the Second World War. And some of the ideas, like uh, masers, were actually proved in microwave first before it has its uh, light or laser come to part, because technologies are often much more easily done at microwave frequencies. We had remote sensing, synthetic aperture radar, interferometric radar computational electromagnetics, and now 
Electromagnetics plays a very important role in the CPU design of computers. And on the other hand, you see that the early optical technology actually were based on ray theory. Lasers actually came after it was proven in microwave frequencies. And of course, they have semiconductor lasers that exploit uh, uh, 20th century physics and then light emitting diodes, optical and optical electronics. What is very amazing to me is the fact that a lot of the ideas like interferometric radar that were proved at microwave frequencies are now being achieved and actually done at the optical frequencies, interferometric imaging as well as optical coherence tomography. This is very much like ground penetrating radar. And a lot of the things that we are doing in nano optics, like making nano antennas, actually is very similar to what we do at microwave many years ago. And there are many, many more. Even a lot of the coding and the multiplexing techniques were actually done at microwave, like uh, uh, time domain multiplexing and, and that kind of thing. And they're actually now being done at optical frequencies. So you can see that microwave actually is a trade base of to many of these advanced technologies that we have. And uh, I'm going the wrong way. Yes. Um, so if you look at where Electromagnetic theory is, you can look at it in this picture. Okay, classically electromagnetic theory actually inspired Young Mills theory, which actually is a kind of uh, generalized electromagnetic theory, and you can connect electromagnetic theory to Young Mills theory uh, to differential geometry, and if you add quantum theory to electromagnetic theory, you have uh, quantum electrodynamics. And then if you add other kinds of physics equations, you have multi-physics modeling, and you have tremendous amount of designs and applications uh, in this field. And if you do mathematical analysis, you can add physical insight, and you can have tools for new scientific discovery, as well as design and application and maintenance communications, radar, as well as uh, computer design. So this is just an experiment that was actually done around 1980. Uh, that actually gave rise to the interest in quantum computing was done by Edgar, uh, Aspect, sorry, done by Aspect, and it proved that Bell's theorem was on the side of the Copenhagen School rather than Einstein's side of the uh, hidden variable theory, and it was actually done with photons. Photons are based on Maxwell's equations, and there will be lots of electromagnetic cal calculations that we can do in this field, I believe. And here is another example of something that was that is quite related to uh, Gabriel Affleck's talk yesterday, because in addition to making artificial atoms using trapped ions and using defects in the, in the silicon lattice, there are also people who make artificial atoms uh, using Cooper care boxes, uh, Josephson junctions, and so on. And these um, Cooper care boxes are actually coupled, actually coupled to uh, microwave devices. There is a lot of microwave engineering that goes on. Instead of using a full microwave cavity, you can make microwave cavities using microwave integrated circuits and do cavity QED at microwave frequencies and study some of this quantum information, quantum computing ideas that are prevailing at this point. So I believe there are lots of things we can do. And we will also talk about Moore's law. Uh, so at lunch, I I thought I remember an article in The Economist that spelled the, ends of, the end of Moore's Law. It actually says that for a dollar, we are getting less and less millions of transistors now. Okay, say by 2012, we can buy 20 million transistors with a dollar. By 2014, we're not going to buy very much more. The cost of miniaturization is going up. And hence, uh, it's not actually cost effective anymore to pack more and more transistors uh, within a given density. And this is actually good news for us who are investigating new, mod, uh, new paradigm for computing. And there's another news about uh, uh, rumors that Moose Law is coming to an end. And this has always been rumored. I think this is a truly the end of Moose Law. Okay? And that actually is very good for many of us. Not, not good for the consumers, but very good for the scientists. <laughs> the, no, the last one is because the fact that it costs more and more to pack more transistors per chip. Okay, 
that the dimensions are going down, if you notice the dimensions are given the like 13 nanometers, 13 nanometers, 16 nanometers, but it just costs a lot more to make uh, nanolithography and you have to use a deep UV, uh, ultra UV kind of thing to make those uh, structures and they're actually trying to stay away from deep UV because it's very costly to make lithography with deep UV. But if the cost goes up, people are not going to min uh, miniaturize anymore. So, Moore's law actually is a self-fulfilling prophecy to a lot of engineers. It has been predicted to end many years ago. I think even by the 1980s, when they joined the University of Illinois, people were spelling the end of Moore's law. Okay. But it's actually clever engineering that has kept it going for many, many years. And you notice that clock rate has actually stopped growing since the 2005 or 2007. Nothing goes faster than 3 gigahertz. And the reason is very simple. You can just use this very simple model. You think of the CMOS or the MOSFET as just a capacitor because it actually takes in charges. And if you take this uh, copper line as a small resistor, which is much less than this capacitor, the current that flows on this circuit as you switch this transistor at this end will grow with frequency because this is actually very small. So the top, the, the power loss in the circuit is actually proportional to I squared R and grows as omega squared. After a while, it's not worthwhile to increase the switching speed anymore. Okay, so that's why clock rate has not gone up. So what do engineers do? Engineers increase the performance of the computer by going much high core. Okay, or they go 3D. We have a lot of 3D. I see that uh, through silicon there, I see one of these uh, being used as an acronym in, in uh, I think Colonel Murray's talk yesterday. So things are growing 3D, but another brick wall has been faced by us is that you have to have intercore communication. Intercore communication is becoming very expensive, and it will be actually is a bottleneck now for uh, this CPU to go further and further in terms of multi cores. So I'm going to start my talk by emphasizing the fact that. Um, in my opinion, electromagnetic physics actually can be divided into three uh, regimes. One is the long wavelength, low frequency regime where you can think of circuit physics being predominant. And when the wavelength is on the order of the size of the antenna, then wave physics becomes very important. And here is actually a very interesting antenna designed by Professor Yaki and Uda in 1926, even before the uh, onset of computers. There were no computers and, and using very good physical insight, they were able to make a very simple waveguide using just an array of dipoles in front of this driver antenna and guide the wave in the opposite direction and just by making this dipole slightly longer, they make this into a reflector and by this very, very simple design, they make an antenna with very high directivity and you can see many of these antennas and this modification on the rooftop of uh, many homes in, in the last two decades or so. And this idea has been actually picked up by people in nano antennas, making some of these antenna arrays uh, very much uh, very much like Yagi Uda antenna. And if you go to even higher frequencies, when the wavelength is very short, I call that the regime of ray physics, where electromagnetic waves behave like particles and they travel in a straight line. One of the wonderful things about Maxwell's equations on electromagnetic theory is that the theory is valid from subatomic length scale to galactic length scale. The radio signals that we re receive from outer galaxy is actually on a galactic length scale. And then remember there, there was a professor at Harvard who spent a lot of time uh, measuring the accuracy of hyper, uh, hyperfine splitting in uh, rebuilt atoms and so on. And those hyperfine splitting were calculated based on the validity of many Coulomb interactions, spin orbital coupling, uh, at a, a communistic level or subatomic level. And if Maxwell's equations had been wrong, uh, those hyperfine splitting would be wrong. So you could quite uh, comfortably accept that Maxwell's equations is still valid on a subatomic length scale and even in the nanometer length scale. So what do we do in terms of computation? Uh, we developed a multi-level fast multi algorithm for multi structure, and one of the things we did actually was 
to be able to put an antenna on the car and simulate this structure uh, up to about uh, a million unknowns. Okay, and that comes about is because, as you can see from corner mule race talk, that we mentioned about boundary element method in electromagnetics, we call it the boundary integral equation method or the surface integral equation method. That gives rise to a dense matrix system. And when you have a dense matrix system, every source helps every other sources on the scatterer. And the matrix vector product would take n square computation to do. However, if you were able to factorize the green function involved in the interaction, you can actually implement a multi level algorithm, like a telephone network, where you only take n log n lines to get all these n sources to talk to each other. And finally, you can reduce something with an n square complexity to an n log n complexity using this uh, international telephone uh, line uh, emulation. And because of that, by around 1999, we could actually solve about 20 million unknowns uh, with uh, a full-size aircraft at 8 gigahertz. And this was done with some of my PhD students and postdocs uh, at Illinois. Okay. But other people actually have taken this uh, data. There's a Spanish uh, group that actually was able to do this problem up to a billion unknowns just around uh, 2012, I believe. And they, they published this kind of work about 2012. And their work's going on in China, Turkey, as well as Belgium. And the Belgian group just reported to me that in 2013, they were able to solve the dense matrix system with about 3 billion unknowns using parallel computers and so on. So let's concentrate on the CPU design, which is the focus of the AOE uh, project. And there are actually many disparate sizes uh, in this project. And Hongo and many of our colleagues actually focus on the transistor simulations down there. And what we focus on is actually what happens on the outside. If you go outside the transistor region, which is at the bottom layer over there, you see what this we call the X and Y lines. But they're still much smaller than the wavelength. If you go further out from this X and Y line, you're in the, the package, and the package might look like this or that, and you can the computer chases at this level. And things are actually very complicated, and then we have electromagnetic interactions at many, many length scales. And actually, things are going 3D, as I mentioned before. One way to fulfill the prophecy of the Moore's law, actually, is to go 3D. There are lots of 3D structures, as you can see, inside the computer. And that's what makes uh, electromagnetic simulation very compli uh, complicated. I think this from Robert Patti of Tesseron. And we actually developed something called the augmented electric field integral equation. And that allows us to simulate something like a multi-scale structure with fine grids and coarse grids together up to a million unknowns using a single CPU. And this was some collaboration with Intel that we had a few years ago. And because of that, uh, with a single CPU, as I mentioned before, uh, we can do this problem. And more recently, uh, I collaborated with researchers here actually uh, Ling Mung and uh, Majid Nahim. And uh, Li Jun Jiang to actually simulate this package, which is actually quite big, I think a few million unknowns. And it's a package that uh, no commercial software can do, I believe. It stops working. I don't know why it stops working, but it's OK. Um, Another thing that we did uh, with uh, researchers at Hong Kong EU is actually to look at preconditioning using what we call the Hadron uh, matrix uh, uh, preconditioning method. And, and that allows us to improve the convergence of iterative solvers. Iterative solvers is the only path to large scale computing. If you don't precondition your system, uh, then you actually have very poor convergence. But with preconditioning, uh, we can actually get conversions to, to uh, go a lot faster. And then another way of dealing with multi scale actually is to use the equivalence principle algorithm. We're given a structure which is very complicated. We divide into domains, just like the domain decomposition in finite elements. But this is done with integral equations and Green's functions rather than differential operators. And because of that, 
we have a well-conditioned system among the equivalent surface, and then there's a reduction of uh, final matrix that I mentioned. Wave physics and circuit physics are separated. When these structures are very fine down there, there are lots of circuit physics going on. But when they interact with each other, they are actually uh, doing it through wave physics. And as I say, this is like domain decomposition in finite element. But using green function radiation condition is automatically satisfied. And there's no great dispersion error. And we can easily hybridize with different methods uh, quite easily. And it's very easy for parallelization. <coughs> and one of the things that we study actually is a way of uh, doing a generalized motor expansion technique. And with this uh, generalized motor expansion technique, we look for efficient ways to look for modes of structures. And the reason why we study this is because I have just seen too many uses of commercial software where people just run the software with no physical insight. So one way is actually to use numerical methods to find the natural modes of this system and see if with the understanding of natural modes of complicated system you can gain better physical insight. We find that many, many physics of a structure can be approximated very well with a small number of modes, even though in theory a structure like this will have infinitely many modes. Here's just an example of a direct solver and then by slowly increasing the number of modes you actually can capture the physics quite well. And here's another example of just by using a small number of modes, you can actually capture the physics of many, many structures. And if you have a software that breaks uh, the solution into modern decomposition, using a small number of them, we can greatly reduce the uh, computation time. Here is another example of uh, doing eigen analysis, where if the eigenvalue is near the origin, it's very difficult to do, but we have a way of shifting it so that this eigenvalue gets shifted to somewhere in the middle of the spectrum or somewhere away from the origin so that it's easier to find. And because of this, uh, we have a way of preconditioning such a kind of system, okay, using a preconditioner, so that after preconditioning, the convergence history of this method is very good. So this actually is a way to look for eigenmodes of very complicated structures and then use those eigenmodes as preconditioners and this problem actually is not only encountered in microwave engineering, it's also encountered in, uh, I guess, the uh, Hongo's NEGF DFT calculations. And if you look at their paper, Hongo and Zheng Wan, they have something called a Van Hoop singularity when they do the uh, NEGF calculation because in a quantum system, dissipation is very small. With almost no, no dissipation, in the electronic device that we try to simulate, the Q is very high. The Q is very high means that there will be resonance points giving rise to this when two singularities. And if iterative solvers are applied to solve those set of equations, convergence is very poor, just like this system over here. I believe that if they apply such a kind of concept, and we can actually help them to get the solution much faster, and I hope that we can collaborate with with their group in the future, and that's where the synergism could happen between electromagnetics and uh, NEGF DFT kind of calculations. And this is actually some work done by uh, Yung Ping Shen, okay, um, uh, layer medium green function. Layer medium green function is extremely compl uh, complicated, and you can do a lot of contour deformations and the kind of thing, and it's very difficult to do. Uh, but he was able to do it and get his PhD from Hong Kong U. And furthermore, he added uh, some of these preconditioners uh, to make uh, his work uh, work better, the Calderon preconditioner. Uh, sometimes it's called the Calderon multiplicative preconditioner as well. And he has to define uh, a very special kind of uh, basis function called the Buffa Christensen function or the routing Wilson function. As a result, you can also improve the convergence of this method uh, by doing this kind of thing. And then we can apply this to other kind of physical concepts like doing spontaneous emission calculations. And you have to learn some uh, concept of local density of states, Purcell effect, and then do some of these calculations so that you can more broadly educate itself. And uh, the layer medium green function is an extremely difficult problem to do. And I always think that uh, people who can do that kind of calculation deserve to go to heaven because they're so complicated. Okay. So another thing that we 
uh, actually look into working on is actually to find the fast way to solve Poisson's equation. As you can see, Poisson's equation is quite calculable. In many places, as you solve a Schrodinger equation, you can also do that with Poisson's equation. Even when you do BFT calculations, you have to solve Poisson's equation. We are actually fast methods to solve Poisson's equation, and we are just looking at an alternative method by doing a Helmholtz theorem, Helmholtz decomposition kind of thing to find a fast way to solve Poisson's equation. And actually, our normal Poisson uh, solver works somewhat like this. And we actually go through a two-stage procedure of solving Poisson's equation. You can solve Poisson's equation directly, but first we solve the divergence of D equals the charge equation. Mathematicians will say, no, no, this divergence operator is non-unique. And it's not invertible, but we have a way of inverting it out anyhow. But after having found D, we can get our E. And the curl of E has to be zero, and hence E has to be orthogonal to the loop basis of E has to be orthogonal to all divergence free bases in the space, and we do a kind of cleansing uh, procedure by this method. And after cleansing the E field, we can use that to solve this equation. And again, the mathematician will say, no, no, because gradient operator has no unique inverse, but we have a way of inverting this equation as well as that equation in an order and complexity fashion. I don't think it competes well with the multi grid method now, which is the problem method that is used to solve Poisson's equation. Hopefully one day we can improve it uh, to an extent so that it can work as fast as multi grid We have done this in 3D as well. This is the work of uh, Mark Ludwig. Okay, and then, uh, as you can see, by using a multi-level approach, we can actually improve the convergence of this method as well, using a hierarchical basis. Another thing that you can do, actually, is look at the extremely high frequency regime when the wavelength is very short. As I said before, when wavelength is very short, light or electromagnetic wave behave like particles. And you can actually think of wave behaving like particles, and you solve the problem using a very different uh, techniques. And one of the things that you can use to solve uh, high frequency scattering is a physical optics approximation. When you make the physical optics approximation, you assume the current on the surface of the scatter to be such. And if you look at those physical optics integral, when k is very long, this integral is highly oscillatory and very difficult to integrate. As indicated by here, when k is small, the integral is not oscillatory. But when k is very long, the integral is highly oscillatory. We have a way of integrating this by making x into a complex number. If you were to integrate x on the ray axis, you have this highly oscillatory thing. But if you think of x as being having a ray part and an imaginary part, you can actually integrate in a complex thing and get this integral to converge very fast. And that's what we did. Uh, we call this the numer uh, numerical steepest descent path method. And by using this method, we can compute things in a frequency independent manner. Many of these integrals can be computed without increasing workload, whereas if you were to use a brute force technique as the frequency goes higher, the workload becomes bigger and bigger, and we can control the accuracy. And this also perhaps has application in throwing the equation, as we know, when the wave number goes very high, okay, h bar goes to zero, we get back the classical physics from this, and here is perhaps a way of uh, getting uh, Schrodinger particles to behave really like particles when the wave number gets very large and, and there might be some applications there as well. And the last thing I'd like to talk about is actually Casimir force calculation. This is an interesting area because students need to be trained in quantum electrodynamics to understand how this Casimir force comes about. And I'd like to point out the fact that this area is also driven by experimental success. In 1997, S.K. Lamoureux was able to prove that this force actually exists. And once he was able to prove that this force existed, then there were slew of papers that have been written on this topic as to how we should calculate this force uh, properly. And if you look at this, finally this actually involves the calculation of density of states, which requires the calculation of the added green function for very complex geometry. And here is the area where computational electromagnetics can come into play. And by contributing to waves, we can find this dialectic green function. 
So as a result, we can use a CEM or computation electromagnetic technique to calculate some of the calcium mirror energy and also calculate plasma force between extremely complicated structures such as this. You can put two of these structures side by side and use some of our augmented electric field integrate equation and computational EM to solve this problem that has never been solved for plasma force before. And one of our postdocs and research assistant professor Wei Sha actually was very interested in looking into uh, nano antennas and how nano antennas uh, interact with uh, dipole radiation or spontaneous emission by a small molecule and he was able to study this using classical electromagnetics. And some of the antenna design concepts, I said, these are not metallic spheres anymore. These are actually dielectric spheres that exhibit panel resonances and he was able to, to make use of these panel resonances to get this antenna to behave in a certain positive fashion. And he was also very interested in organic uh, solar cell modeling, where he actually had to solve Maxwell's equation and had to store, uh, solve for the adoption of the optical field by the semiconductor materials inside the solar cell. And then he had to solve the drift diffusion equation uh, inside the solar cell in order to model it properly together with the Poisson Boltzmann equation over here. Okay. And as a result, he was able to model solar cells and predict the performance of solar cells uh, from almost first principles, and he was able to edit plasmonic effect because he had Maxwell's equations in there. So these are some of the multi-physics uh, calculations that are ongoing in our research group over here. And the last work actually is done by Jun Huang, who is actually going to Mark Longstrom's group to serve as a postdoc under Blinback. It actually came with the electromagnetics background. And uh, because of the interaction with the physics and the chemistry department here, uh, we started to get an interest into how we can use electromagnetic methods to expedite some of the calculations you have in NEGF and so on. So we went to effective mass modeling K.P models as well as pipe binding models, but see how we can cross-pollinate ideas from electromagnetics to help solve this problem. And one of the things that uh, we did very simple using some of these uh, vertical equations to calculate the transmission coefficient is to expedite these calculations using the asymptotic waveform evaluation method so that we can calculate many of these parameters a lot faster than before. And this actually is very similar to some of the work that goes in uh, Mark uh, Longstrom's group. And then another thing that we did actually is look into how we can calculate band structures very efficiently. It turns out that we can use model order reduction to calculate band structures very efficiently instead of having to calculate those uh, values at all wave numbers and all frequencies. You can actually project those calculations into a few wave numbers and a few frequencies and use a reduced model or model order reduction method to arrive at a much smaller matrix so they can calculate this uh, band structures almost identically as before, but using a lot less computer time. And then we work with Wang Hua Chen's group okay, to actually look at the simulation of junctionless transistors using k.p method and some of this uh, way to uh, simulate the transistors and getting some of the parameters out from this kind of model. And this is actually a tunneling transistor, I believe, using the same kind of model, uh, model order reduction together with uh, mode matching and so on, we were able to model uh, some junctionless transistor together with, I think Li Ming Chang is with Wang uh, Sun Chen, and then CY Yan is actually with Wang Hua Chen. So this is actually inter-university, uh, inter-departmental collaboration within Hong Kong uh, by modeling the uh, the coming uh, FETs and so on. And also, he was very clever. Uh, Jung Huang was actually able to do some of this uh, thing using clever techniques of uh, mode matching and reduction so that he can do mode matching a lot faster than before and he can do a lot of these calculations reducing the complexity from n cubed to n divided by p cubed and getting a lot of these calculations to be a lot faster than before. So in conclusion, I have given a brief history of electromagnetics and review the morphing of physics 
of the electromagnetics from static to optics. And then we review a few multi-physics opportunities in using traditional electromagnetic tools. And wave physics methods such as AWE or asymptotic waveform evaluation method and model order reduction method can be also used to solve quantum transport problems. And I think that quantum uh, computational electromagnetics will become increasingly important in nano optics, quantum optics, and quantum information. You can see yesterday from a Gabriel Apti spoke that even with his uh, artificial atom, he needs to interact with electromagnetic fields. And there are also other people who study artificial atoms using Cooper pair boxes. And there will be many, many electromagnetic simulations that will be ongoing in the future. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Can I ask one? Uh, in this uh, high Q cavity type of physics, um, you know, you, have the, you mentioned you have a method which shifts this uh, sort of uh, uh, resonance points by uh, how exactly what, what, what is. Uh, I can go into more detail. No, no, no. Uh, just roughly speaking, what is the idea behind this? You know, so for example, I I, I want to integrate through some contour or something, and my 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 peaks are outside this contour. How do I shift it? You know, that that kind of. Well, thing. what happens is that the resonance point usually compare, uh, corresponds to some zero eigenvalues of the matrix system. Mm -hmm. So when it corresponds to the zero eigenvalue of the matrix system, eigenvalues that are small are hard to find. If you use a Cree law subspace methods, which are iterative methods, they tend to find the large eigenvalues first. Because, because by iteration, you actually emphasize the large eigenvalues. So if you don't shift the zero eigenvalues away from the origin, you are never found. But if we have a way of shifting the eigenvalue away from the origin, and so that they become larger, you will be found by the iterative solver. So if you have a resonance eigenvalue, you can subtract out this eigenvalue. Okay. That actually is giving rise to your Van Hoop singularity that actually is problematic in terms of convergence. We can actually help to improve the convergence of those solutions because we have already extracted the singularity out. So I think with this kind of treatment, we can help solve some of the NEGF, DFT problems that you are encountering uh, in, in uh, nano electronic transport because there's almost no dissipation in a quantum system. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, uh, so let's have a uh, coffee break. Let's thank our speaker uh, again. So we will be coming at 11. Okay, let's keep our schedule. Okay.